All right, Persia, welcome to the show, my love. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to have this conversation. Me too. So you are one of the UK's most successful love coaches, uh, according to the Times. And I personally know just how powerful your work is. You work with women in this modern dating world. You help, you essentially help women to meet their soulmates and break through a lot of unconscious dating patterns. And you're not just helping people to meet their soulmates, you're actually helping them to keep their soulmates. So I'd love to hear more about like what it is that you do and how it is that you're helping people. Mm. I love that you said that, meet and keep. And it's funny, until you meet them, you think that's the hardest part. (laughs) Yeah. That's what my clients always say. Oh, when I just get that relationship, I'm like, trust me, you'll get it and it will be great in ways and it will also be really fucking hard because as they say, new level, new devil. And I remember finding that really confusing when I met Joe, my uh, fiance of like, well, we've been together nearly five years, which is bloody miracle, like literally, because I was a disaster in my love life for such a long time, well, for all of it. Um, And I, when I met him, we started our relationship and I'd say 75, 80% was incredible, but this 20% of it was so challenging because it brings all your shit up. um, And Mm -hmm. that's that's what's meant to happen. So uh, whilst I'd say the majority of my work is about supporting women, to do the really deep work to understand like, what are my blocks? Because what I've come to realize is like, you know, this is really a manifesting manifestation chat um, in that sense that the only thing that the distance between us and getting that relationship or really anything we want is the level of resistance we have to it coming. That's, I mean, that's really just mm. what you said, isn't it? It's, you know, your job is not to seek for love. It's to seek for all the barriers that you have built within yourself towards it coming and um and do you know what that makes me think of this is one of the most beautiful um ways I sum up my work because a lot of people say are you you know are you are you trying to change people I'm like no no, 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 I'm actually not trying to change people as such Michelangelo the artist he built that incredible statue of David we all know it the really tall white marble statue with his willy hanging out and so <laughs> asked Michelangelo like how did you create David and he said oh it was easy I looked at the marble and I simply cut away everything that wasn't David and it's like my whole body got chills because that's the same process I take women on and I you know certainly I took myself on it wasn't like Mm. I you know who Persia is is not okay and I need to become someone else I actually needed to become more of myself because there was just all this layers a lot of it was trauma from childhood Then there's, you know, expectations and pressure from family, friends, society, like all of, there's just so much shit that gets placed on us. It's about stripping all of that away because I think we lose sight of who we are. We have no idea. We know as babies and as small children. And then, you know, we just go through the great unlearning, um, essentially. And so that's, that's really at the core of what I do. It's, it's helping women get in touch with who they are and fall in love with themselves because you cannot call in your soulmate until you realize that you are your soulmate. You know, I've, I've seen mm. you say that before, like, you know, we are the ones that we're looking for. I spent my entire yeah. life, like, just looking for anything. And it was, you know, I used men as much as I used pretty much anything else, getting A stars, being top, being the best, mm-hmm. um, being, you know, the prettiest, or, or, or if I wasn't the prettiest, then I'd find something else that, oh, I'll be the funny one then, because she's pretty. You know, I'd always find a way for me to somehow get some power. And it was exhausting. It was absolutely exhausting. So that's it. It's the process of coming back to who we are, falling madly deeply in love with ourselves, realizing that we are the ones we've been looking for, looking at all that, dismantling all that childhood trauma. And then it's really Mm -hmm. about getting clear as to like, what do I want? Like, what do I actually value? Because if you're anything like I used to be, I was like, I just want a boyfriend. Well, if you say that, you, you yeah. might get a boyfriend, but you will get any old boyfriend. And let me tell you, like, be clear, get specific. Like, what do you want? And if you don't know yourself, you won't be able to answer that question. Mm. You don't even know what, I didn't know what I valued. I really didn't know what I valued. And so that's it, core values, like really, really understanding what do I value and and, and what's important to me in a partner. Yeah. It's also another thing that I think 
particularly in the model world, modern world so many of us struggle with, and this isn't just in our romantic life, it's being present. So what, what that looks like in our romantic life is like, even if we are dating someone, we're on all the apps, just in case that one goes to shit. I'm going to have all these other things going on. I'm, I'm like, you know, I, or I'm on a date and they go to the bathroom and I'm just sat on the phone or like, you know, we, we are so not present. Our attention spans are like so bloody short. And, and it, another way, this is what I used to do. My old party trick on dates was, um, oh, I wonder what our kids would look like. I don't even know if I wanted kids, but I would just be sitting there as a wedding <laughs> moment. What do our kids look like? What would what would I wear on my wedding day? What would you know? What would that? Look, what would it look like? Me walking down the aisle to him? I was like not mm. in the bloody aisle, and so therefore I had no idea if we were compatible. I had no idea if we had the same same values because I was so desperate like needing that validation and attention from someone that I would just accept anything. So I had no standards and I had no fucking boundaries either. That's another wow. piece of the work, having raising your standards, having boundaries, being clear about what you want, and then doing all that really deep intuitive work to connect in with your soul so that you can listen for the guidance that says, even though on paper, this guy isn't right, this guy doesn't look how you think it should look, something in your mm -hmm. gut says, yes. Or, you know, I mean, the guidance can come in all sorts of ways. And one of the hardest things that most of us don't want to hear is this isn't right. Walk away. Like, I find that we, we want to stay in the things that are terrible for us and we want to run for the things that are good for us, because in those things that are good for us, as you know, we both know they're they're also really fucking hard because they really yeah. like the mirror you are seeing the mirror and all of your stuff will come up it will always it will always come up but you're not getting the opportunity to stay stuck like you're like you're seeing it and you have a choice of like run away because I can't deal with that or stay and heal and that mm. is so much of what my work in my own relationship has been over the last five years staying and healing when it gets fucking hard yes oh my god so much so much in there that I want to dive into more with you and what I'm really what I really love about you is there's no shortcuts in your in your work. It's do the deep inner work, do the healing work, do the work on yourself. You know, that's the real, that's the real work. It's not like, you know, you see some dating coaches that it's like, text this and message that. And if you say this, it'll play play hard to get, you know, it'll make you seem unavailable. And all of this is really just bollocks, isn't it? Because none yeah. of this is actually creating any inner transformation or healing or shift so you're just gonna essentially keep repeating the same pattern and keep playing these power games with people and it will work, it might work in the short term but in yeah. the short term and that's oh, it it's, like, yeah it seems like it works it seems like it works but is it really working if it's just like a power game like yeah. it, in my experience like any relationship that starts off with games it's just like not like just doomed you know yeah. everyone that I hear that has met their soulmate it starts off just feeling like wow I'm so myself with this person I can be so myself there's no games it's just it's just us and it's just easy um yeah. But yeah, yeah, like I remember thinking, like I, I was thinking when I was growing up, I was like, by the time I'm 25, I want to, by the time I'm 21, I want to be married um, or ha at least have met my person. By the time I'm 25, I want to be a mom. Like I want to have already started having kids. And I think like everyone that's our age has kind of got to like their, their like, you know, 20s, 30s and they're like, oh, times have changed <laughs> like that's not really what is what we're seeing right now and I think because of this pressure that we've had growing up to like meet the person get married have a house uh start having kids straight away what I've seen is like a lot of people have kind of settled for what represents security but what isn't necessarily love Mm -hmm. because they've wanted that kind of like they just want to tick the boxes and they don't really mind who it is they just want the, the boxes ticked and as long as it's okay it doesn't matter if we're not soulmates we're just that you know it's a good life and yeah. then there are the people that are like you know trusting their heart and waiting for their soulmate and they're not meeting this person um and you know they they, they you know I'm hearing from a lot of single women where are all the men that want to do inner work um mm -hmm. you know what would your response be to that because I think there's a lot of women that are doing this work that are listening to this podcast that are on a personal spiritual development journey and 
they're not experiencing men that can meet them there. Is that something mm. that they're not able to shift themselves? Is that something that they have to accept? Like, what's your take on that? Mm, this is such a good question. And this is something that's been coming up a lot. I've been getting quite asked this a lot because the way that us women tend to work, this is a blanket statement, but I'm talking to, I know anyone listen to this, your interpersonal development, because why would you be listening to this otherwise? Or at least to a degree. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, me and you are so similar, Melinda, that we're like, right, we turn up, we like a star, here with our little notebook and pen, like we are ready to go. <laughs> and you know what, Joe has been the biggest eye opener. Like, I, I'll be honest, right, Mel, when I met Joe, I remember thinking, oh my God, I'm going to teach you so much. <laughs> Because I met him at I met him at Wilderness Festival where I was speaking. So I was like, and I just got the, you know, just written the first draft of the Fix, had the book deal for that. So was feeling quite smug about everything. And what I proceeded to learn is that Joe might not have had all the language and been in all the seminars and at the events and whatever. And yet he seemed to have naturally these things that I have to work so fucking hard at. Like naturally really kind. Like, I don't know that I am. I've got more so now because I've practiced it. Like, I, I that's not definitely, that's not the first trait. I would describe myself as naturally kind, patient, um, forgiving. But like, you literally just can't hold a grudge. Like, I can hold, a, I mean, I am so much better than I was, but my God, can I hold a grudge? Like, I really can. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of women can really relate to that. Um, I, basically, I think what's happened is us women, and I get why we do it, because if you look on the surface level, we go, oh, men, dickheads, ghost us, do all this shit, and totally not taking responsibility for all our bullshit. And actually, mm. we have so much to learn from men. That's the biggest lesson. And they have so much to learn from us. And so I think that what's happening in the great awakening that is going on in 2020 is that, you know, women are, are in the way that I have, like, I... I you know, Joe and I now practice yoga together. Like I've, I've, I've definitely introduced him to certain modalities. What he has done for me is just how he shows up and how he's shown up from day one. Generous, speaks to everyone and anyone, does not see rank, does not, is not interested in that. Like, and that's something I've had to work at because I, like, I was an actress. So I was like programmed from such a young age to, to think in quite like, quite frankly, like capitalist, really gnarly ways. Um, and I think that's it. So we got to get out that narrative of saying, where are all the men? And we need to just say, like, stop looking at it. Like, oh, you know, the man has to drink green juice and do yoga and all these things. Like that can come later as it has for me and Joe. The only thing you need to focus on is how are you showing up? Because let me tell you, I have hidden behind the bullshit of self-development speak and spiritual speak. I think we all have. And so if you're asking that mm. question, you need to look at like, don't, you are not better because you practice yoga or do meditation or even have a language to speak like this. I, I have learned more from like a five minute chat with a homeless man in Thailand than I've learned from gurus who earn a hell of a lot of money from speaking on stage. So we have to get out of that mindset. And your only job is to show up as your most authentic self, as your most vulnerable, truthful self, do all your deep work and just fucking be the light. And you will be surprised. Like I, that's what I see a lot is my clients who they end up with is not who they thought it would be on paper. And yet, yeah. Like you want to have somewhere to evolve towards and it can go the other way too. Like I know guys who were super like into self-development and spirituality and like they've ended up supporting their, their girls or their ladies getting into it. But just a little side note there, as I've learned the hard way, you like, it isn't sexy to be like, you know, put the leaflet in front of them or put the website up or like get, you know, force them to come to events with you. I've done all that. They don't like it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. totally. So what I'm hearing you say is that you like relax if not all the boxes that you think need to be ticked are ticked. Um, and also just kind of accept, like, can you love and accept them for them? And, you know, and some of those at. qualities. Yeah. And where they're at. And, you know, I was actually having this conversation with a client of mine the other day and I said, like, can you love him now if he never changes these things that you want changed? Mm. Like, can you if, he, if nothing ever changed, can you still love the person that you're in this relationship with today? 
And I think for a lot of people, that is the work because we fall for this idea of this potential of who we think yes. they could be instead yeah. of looking at the man who's in the room with you um, yeah. and really thinking, do I love this person? Is this the person that I want to be with if nothing changes? Because ultimately, yeah. the only person who can create change is that person themselves. Yeah. They've got to want to change. You can't mm-hmm. force them to, to change, whether that's like getting them into meditation or taking them, like making them want to go to a seminar, like it's you know I think yeah they can be influenced by you and Mm -hmm. can want to do those things but it's usually by you just leading by example by you just being the example um and then it's them it's up to them to say oh what's that thing you're going to I'd quite like to do that Mm -hmm. rather than you saying here's this course that you should do or here's this coach you should work with yeah um and I'd also like to say that with with Rick and I, like when like obviously Rick is super into self development and trauma healing and spirituality, and he's very much into all that and was before I met him. In fact, mm. when I met him, he was a lot more into it than I was, and mm. that was one of the things for me that I was like, oh, I don't know if I can date a spiritual man. Like it's a bit, a bit too much for me. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I, I was so used to date. I was just so used to unconscious relationships. Yeah, that it was really terrifying for me. That's yeah. the truth. This is like three and a half, four years ago um so that was interesting but I I remember thinking to myself like this is really scary but it Mm. is completely different than my usual type and my usual type has not been working this Mm. feels different it feels I feel calm my nervous Mm. system is not jacked up from anxiety and games Mm. We're, we're creating a friendship let's just Mm -hmm. trust that and lean into it rather than run away and you know when we were first messaging we had this joke we would put the running the run emoji because I was getting so scared all the time and I was like Mm -hmm. wanting to run all the time and I was like no I'm not gonna run I'm not gonna run Mm -hmm. I'm gonna stay I'm gonna stay Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. but also what I want to say on that point is we have grown together we weren't necessarily each other's perfect partner when we met but we've mm. naturally organically grown together so that now we feel like each other's perfect match. Um, mm. But when I first met him, would I have said, oh my God, perfect match? No, because I didn't know what, I didn't, I didn't know what that was. Like I had an idea in my head of what the boxes that I thought were ticked needed to be ticked. Um, mm. But only when I started becoming my own soulmate and started doing the work on becoming the partner that I wanted to date, um, did this man walk into my life and I actually had the awareness to um, to actually stay in the room and not keep running um, yeah. which is you yeah. know largely down to what I've learned with you so yeah can you speak more into that oh god I so relate to that I so relate to that and that's why like we because like it's this bloody bullshit like you're saying the timeline um we like we want it we want to know all the steps and we want to know what it's going to look like and that's just because we are so insecure we don't know who we are and we don't understand that is not how life works life just doesn't work like that and the more you try and control and suffocate you you suffocate it you suffocate it all you know I have uh one of the things I always say to my clients is keep it in the date which is you know taken really from AA where they talk about keep it in the day, which for me, like I have to, I have that written like in so many post-it notes, wherever I am, keep it in the day, but keep it in the date when you're in the relationship. And I'm even mean when you were like Joe and I five years in, because then, you know, you, it becomes exciting. You savor it, you enjoy it, but we are not the same people. We are not the same people we were when we met. And yet we are like us, our soul is, but how we are showing up, we've grown up together. Mm. Like in a way it's so endearing when I look back, like, like I'm like, oh look, baby Persia and Joe running around that festival, like, so, <laughs> so, like loved up. And yet they had all these challenges coming. And I know that we all have more coming, but what's been so interesting. And I know that we, you and me have talked about this before is like, this is going to sound so unsexy, but this is the reality. It's like, the recovery rate, you get through the shit so much quicker. So it's not to say me and Joe don't bicker, but even like when we bicker now, we like just laugh. Like we we kind of do it in a really playful, silly way. And because we know each other, we know yeah. how to do it before. You know how like when you're in a dark, like or an unconscious relationship, you know, like I know what pushes buttons. So I'll say this and I'll make that jab. And like, don't get me wrong. Whilst I have those moments of like wanting to do that, And I used to fall into the trap. Now I'm so much better at being like, no, because I love this person, even when they're fucking me off. Like, no, I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to switch it around and make it funny and playful. And and we know how to do that. We've got much better at that. When we do have a blow up, and we, you know, we have them every now and then, 
for some reason, every time we're about to come down to Cornwall, we came down here a couple of weeks ago. And it's like the day we're about to leave, for some reason, we're, it's because we're about to be in a car for like six fucking hours from London. Something comes up. And where that would mean in the past, we sat the entire drive to Cornwall not talking. Because I'm like, you know, that's <laughs> And now it takes us half an hour. We get everything off our chest. We talk and we're like adults. And yet sometimes it's like louder voices, but it's never nasty. And then at the end of it, you know, we have a big hug and we, we're like, I'm so grateful for that because now that's out the way and now we're clear on that. And I think that's it. It's like the same as like working out. Like this is the thing, you know, we get for our bodies that we have to work out. Why do we not understand that we have to do the same in our love life, wherever we are at? If we are single and we want to be in a relationship, what are we doing to work those muscles? Because if you haven't been, they become flabby and like, you know, you need to have like, you know, essential like muscular structure. I don't even know the wording is. And it's the same when you're in a yeah. relationship. Like it's, it is work, but it's, you know, I don't, I don't really see it as work so much. I see it as challenging at times, but you get better, you get stronger. And then you, st you really do, you feel like a team. And I know that you understand that as well. And and we wouldn't be in that place if it wasn't for the shit we come through. And I think the reason, mm. you know, I'm always really careful when I say this because I never, and so I'm going to say this and I'm going to look in the camera as I say this, do not take what I'm about to say as a reason to stay in an abusive or a toxic relationship because that's not what I'm saying. My parents went through a very, very dark drug um, addiction and very, very rarely um, does even one person get out of that. Both of them did when I was about 16. And I've seen them completely transform their own individual lives, their life as a couple, our family life, their, you know, finances, everything. Our family was on the brink of bankruptcy. Like they are, they're an incredible team. But the key is that they, like, you can't work a relationship is the sum of the two people in it. You can't work on the relationship together if you are not doing what you both need to do individually. That will probably look different from you, for you and the man. You, it's not up to you how they choose to do it. You just have to sense like, does this fit? Like, does it feel like there's something changing or not? And that takes time. Um, but I do believe it's really possible to transform really dark things. But the key is both of you have to be willing to do, yeah, the personal work. Yeah. And the work Together. And then it becomes, you know, there's a beautiful Shakespeare sonnet, and he, I'm going to get it completely wrong, but he talks about this idea that ruined love grows fairer than at first, more strong, far greater. And, and I think that can be taken the wrong way to think, oh, yeah, I'm going to get back with my dickhead ex. No, it's talking about two people who have fucked up or who have struggled and who have like made the adult decision of, I want to be here and I'm willing to do what it takes. And not with all the drama, like calm and taking responsibility. And that's what I'm really passionate about and excited to see. Because when you when you have conscious couples like that, and it's not this bullshit of it all being perfect because it does not look perfect and anyone who says it does is, is a fucking liar. But when you have that, <laughs> I believe the whole society changes because the children, if that couple has a kid, that kid will grow up in a different environment. The way that they operate, yeah. the way that they relate in the world, because otherwise what happens, like where, you know, divorce, addiction, family breakdown, uh, suicide, like so many of these really fucked up things, they come from a place, you know, toxic relationship relationship stress is like like one of the biggest factors in in suicides and in, in addictions it's a very big contributing factor and I really don't see it being talked about enough so I will I didn't yeah, expect no. no no that's great I mean I completely agree like changing the world is really possible through changing our relationships and how we relate to each other because relationships are at the center of everything we change that we change absolutely everything um, and that's what, that's the thing. Like we're not taught relationship skills at school. We should be. That's the most mm -hmm. important thing in our lives. Why are we not taught this? You know, exactly. one of the many things that we need to unlearn and, and relearn um, yeah. in our world today. So there's going to be a lot of single women listening to this podcast and they're going to be like, I'm ready, Persia. Like I want to meet the one, tell me what I need to do. Like I've been trying everything what is your advice for them? Do you have like steps that they can take to start doing this work to kind of uncover some of these big blocks that they might have? Mm -hmm. Well, why? Well, yes, I do, Mel. I do. I have five, in fact. <laughs> so, well, Great. I mean, I, I could so I could go on and on about this, but let's keep it really super simple. So the first thing is, you know, going back to what I said earlier, you've got to be really clear on why the fuck it hasn't worked so far. 
You know, so many people are so desperate to jump and they keep making the same patterns. You like just like I get all my clients do a detailed relationship inventory. And, you know, all you need to really do is like look back at every single relationship or, you know, romantic dynamic and 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 analyze the fuck out of it. What went wrong? Why were you attracted to them in the first place? You know, what did you do wrong? What did they do wrong? Just, just you know, just write some notes on each one and you will spot some fucking patterns there. Those patterns mm-hmm. will always be linked to your childhood, predominantly stuff that's happened with your parents because they are our biggest um, blueprint for a relationship. Some clients I see that, you know, they might've had a happy family, but they got really badly bullied at school. And so their self-worth goes down and they lose all their confidence or they they find that they have to operate in a really bullshit, inauthentic way. And that was actually me in a lot of ways. I mean, to be honest, show me a kid who hasn't been bullied in some way. And I know like Joe was bullied really badly. I've definitely been bullied, but um, compared mm. to other things that had gone happen in my life, like the bullying wasn't the worst thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really getting clear on what are my blocks and also what are my patterns? Like what are my patterns in dating? Do I jump into bed with them straight away? Um, do I always cheat? That was my issue. Do I, um, am I always like, you know, multiple dating to hedge my bets? Um, am I always going, going for a player, like getting really clear at like, cause this is another thing is that people are so willing, women particularly when I speak to them are so willing to talk about how shit men are and they, and then I ask them a few very probing questions and they're like, fuck, it's like, yeah, when you point at someone, three fingers pointing back at you, like stop playing the motherfucking victim and realize that you are an adult woman. If you're watching this, I'm sure you are. It's time to take responsibility. This is for anyone really over the age of 18 watching this, like listen, I cried boohoo till the cows came came home, didn't change a fucking thing. When you realize like (laughs) your romantic life is a reflection of what's going on in you. Everything in your life is sometimes really painful. And this is not, please understand, this is not me putting down anyone who's been through serious trauma. Like Mm -hmm. I get it. Like I had had a tricky childhood. I know people who've had a way harder childhood than me. It's not saying that. It's saying, but now you're an adult. What do you want to do with it? Because you're the yeah. o- you, you know, you're the only one who can change it. So it's really yeah. you know, radical. Radical responsibility is probably one of the biggest sort of pillars in my work, and that's mm. really what the first, the first step is about. Yeah, looking back, what wasn't yeah. working, looking how I'm showing up. Yeah. So looking at the patterns, taking a bit of an inventory, like identifying what those patterns are. You know, for me, when I did this, I remember seeing a pattern of like swinging from like, um, you know, a really good, safe, uh, you know, solid, good, good guy to then swinging to this like super unhealthy, toxic, bad Mm -hmm. boy type. And just kind of like swinging between the two and not... Yeah, the pendulum. Do you see that a lot with the clients that you work with? Is that quite oh a common God, thing? A hundred percent. In fact, there's a there's a little section in the inner fix where I said, um, I said basically what I would do is I would um, you know, be attracted to the bad boy because aren't we all? Because it's dangerous, it's exciting, and also subconsciously what's going on is, oh, he's emotionally unavailable, which means I'm not actually, even though I tell myself, I really want a relationship. My subconscious goes, don't even know what that means. That sounds terrifying. This is great. I can just play out the same old bullshit here because better the devil you know, like us humans are always drawn to what is familiar, even if it's shit. And if you go out with someone emotionally unavailable, it means that you get to keep hiding too. Like you're the one that gets to keep hiding and being actually emotionally unavailable. So that was one of the big things for me as well. Like, oh, I'm attracted to emotionally unavailable people. Why could this be? Why could this be? Oh, because I am emotionally unavailable because I'm hiding from my true self. That was huge for me. That, yeah, c- completely relate. And that's something that women can't get their head around because they're like, no, no, no. And I go, watch what, I, I literally can say to some clients, watch what happens when a good guy comes along. You will want to run for the hills or you want to sabotage it. And that's what I did. So I was with mm-hmm. the bad boy, bad boy, bad boy, eventually win him because I just, you know, did all the manipulation tools that there was. Um, and then eventually, you know, he'd dick me about or do something. And then I'd be like, oh, and then I just look around, nice guy, nice guy. And there was always some nice poor, poor bugger that I would just like latch onto. And then he would be like, because I was such a powerful energy for better or worse, or for worse, you know, they would be kind of, you know, then they were essentially playing out. I became the bad girl that needed rescuing. And my God, how many mm. times I've been in that position? And we don't talk, I don't think this gets talked about a lot. The, 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 the lost 
vulnerable, messed up girl. And so that's how we just justify treating the bad, the good guy like shit. Eventually I get bored with the poor good guy. Where's a yeah. bad, oh, there's a bad boy. So I'm going to go and sabotage it yeah. and like play the same thing and- out. And men have these exact same patterns in reverse. So just as we fall for the, we might fall for the bad guy, you know, based on our own trauma from childhood or based on us wanting the unavailable because it means that we don't have to show up. Guys have these same patterns as well. Falling for the, for the bad girl, for the traumatized Mm. girl, for the girl that needs rescuing so they can feel like the hero. You know, this is not just a thing for us. They've got the exact same thing going on based on their relationship with their mother, you know, their wounds from the feminine and all, all of their shit as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's really all playing out unconsciously for everyone. A hundred percent. And I, that's why I always say like, I am so glad that I didn't meet Joe a second before I met him. Like, because we were at the same festival the year before, both of us were not in a good place, like really. Um, I was only a few, I was only like three months out of a relationship. And so uh, maybe four months out of a relationship and I just wasn't ready. And I guarantee me and Joe probably bloody walked past each other or stood next to each other. But it's like the spirits was like, no, 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 you're not ready yet. And and mm-hmm. this is really hard because when I see clients and like, oh, when's it gonna happen? When's it gonna happen? I'm like, as as until you get to the pr- place in yourself where you stop asking that question and you just say, mm. do you know what? I desire it, but I know it will come when it comes, when it's meant to come. And in the meantime, I've got a pretty fucking epic relationship with myself. I've got a pretty fucking epic life. I've got incredible friendships with my girls. Like I've got a, like who, and when you're in living from that space, you're magnetic as fuck. Like who is, and you will like, rise to shit. Like honestly, that totally is true. true. Do you know, that is that is not talked about enough because when when I met Rick, I had just moved to Bali. Like I was feeling so good. I was working on myself. I was working on my love life. Like I was doing my own thing, like creating my own world. Like I was the happiest and the freest that I'd ever felt, mm-hmm. um, you know? So I think there's there's not enough to be to be said around that. Okay, yeah. so something else that I want to talk on. What if someone's listening to this and they're like, okay, identify my patterns, like look at my patterns. What if someone's listening and they're like, but I've been single forever. I don't have any patterns because I've not been with anyone. That's your pattern. (laughs) Right. I get, I do get women. Um, I get less of these women, but I I have, I've worked with a lot of clients over the years. Um, And what this is called in Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, which I've been going to for years, um, it's called, it's called anorexia, not to be confused. Like, to, well, but actually, do you know what's interesting? Because there's a lot of similarities. Like if you think about anorexia nervosa as in the eating, um, mm-hmm. the eating disease, that's not, you know what I mean? Um, it's, you know, it's like we, sh- we shrink ourselves. Like we don't mm-hmm. take in the sustenance we need and we make ourselves smaller. Yeah. Starving um, ourselves. That's it. And I, and this can happen a lot with women who've never had a partner. And so they are, they don't know what it feels like, but that becomes a narrative. It becomes a belief. It becomes an expectation of like, and, and it, yeah, it becomes their story. Like, oh, I've never had a part. I've never had a partner. And they, they repeat it and they repeat it and they repeat it. They almost sometimes might wear it as a badge of honor and like a, a humorous thing. Like, oh yeah, to my friends, I'm the one who's like always single, you know? And the reason that they latch on, even though they don't want to be that person is like, well, that's my identity. And like, it makes us feel good. Like I used to be, oh, I'm just the messed up, like ridiculous one. And even though like, you know, I had the most ridiculous stories, like, but I was like, yeah, but mine are the most ridiculous. And so again, it's like, we will create identity out of the darkness because that's better than nothing. And so that is your pattern and it's really understanding, okay, so what part of, like, why, what happened? Look back to childhood. That so terrified me or so made me feel like it wasn't safe to be vulnerable and to be to be open. And so that's it. In, in, in Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, it's called, it's called anorexia, like sexually anorexic. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it can be really linked to body, you know, a lot of people who, um, might binge eat or are are super overweight. It's, and I, and I, you know, I put on two stone in two months when I was in my darkest time. And of course I wasn't consciously doing that. I wasn't doing anything consciously at that time. It was just all over the fucking place. But it was like, literally I was in so much pain and trauma because I'd been, I'd actually been sexually abused in this strip club I was working at, but I, I hadn't even computed that that's what happened because I just... I just shut that down. In fact, I'd had quite a few in that that year of very dark sexual abuse things. That is, it's only taken me even till recently to be able to actually verbalize that. 
And, um, mm. and so I put essentially eight and put this layer around myself, which is a really common thing I see as well. Like, you know, our, our work has had so many cross sections and that's one of the things I often see with the women who come to work with me. If there's, if there's issues around yeah. romance, there tends to be issues around food and body and because it's all yeah. into self love and, you know, how For we sure. feel ourselves. Yeah, for sure. Like I see this as well with women that um, struggle around sex um, mm. because the the binge eating and the the comfort eating and the like a, like a lot of weight gain. Obviously, like weight gain, weight loss, like fluctuating like here and there is like pretty normal. But like for like a, like a substantial amount of weight gain can often be this unconscious way to protect the body, um, to yeah. desexualize oneself, to protect oneself against being sexual it's like yes. I will not it's like the unconscious way of saying I'm not available sexually for anyone because mm -hmm. there's been some kind of trauma or wounding that's taken place and mm -hmm. oftentimes the person doesn't even realize that that's what's going on they just think I've got a food issue I've got a problem I can't stop eating uh, and they've yeah. not made the link um great so first step we're going off on many tangents but I love it I so know. much because I just love it um I love you and Every every tangent is so got is such gold. So let's keep let's keep going down the tangent. Delicious tangent tangent. So good. Delicious tangents. So the first one, identify your patterns. Um identify take an inventory. In that in that part, are they like going right? Identify the pattern and kind of get like understand where it comes from or have at least yeah. an idea of where it comes from. Making the links. This is what we do in um the first module of my program, Get Your Soulmate, like really detailed is to, okay, because to check, like awareness is not enough. You have to understand where it came from because if you don't understand that, it becomes very hard to change it. And so there's mm -hmm. always a, um, a pattern that's initiated in childhood where you are trying to win something and get something. Um, and that does, and then, then you carry that over into adult life. So for example, let me just give you an example. Say you had... Uh, you always go for really controlling boyfriends who are really critical of you and, you know, put you down a lot. Um, this is something I, you know, seen in quite a few clients. And then you do, you look back and you discover, oh, their mother was super critical. So what the inner child is trying to do in that situation, it playing out uh, in their adult relationships trying to get my critical mother to love me and accept me as I am but of course you're, you're kind of fighting a losing battle there I mean it's not to say that the critical boyfriend won't change but until you bring awareness into this and you know you really illuminate it like you cannot make them not critical of you the key is to look at yourself and go like why would I, why am I putting myself in this situation why because it's familiar and I'm trying to win something so it's really mm. understanding like just do some detailed notes around what happened when I was growing up with my parents, ch like school, were there, what are the significant things I remember, like that I can remember? And some of them you may well have repressed, but if you just start, do it as a journaling exercise and, and literally write at the top of the page, close your eyes and write, what, well, no, open your eyes to write this, this sentence actually. <laughs> but, well, you know, what do I need to know about my childhood? Like, what do I need to know about my childhood? And you might, and just start free writing and, you know, you might write some loads of random shit and it doesn't matter, but eventually you will come to something like, oh, I totally forgot that. And by the way, it never ends. Like, I've done so much fucking work on my childhood and like all this shit will like pop up all the time because we're never done. Yeah. Like we've, you know, yeah. think about how many, like how much of your, like, like how much of yesterday do you remember? I barely remember anything of today. Like there's a lot of hours <laughs> in the day. So if you think about it, like yeah. we've got like years of memories that we have repressed because otherwise we'd go crazy if we remembered everything. Um, and, and when you, yeah, when that comes up, start to make, it's what's so fascinating for me, it's like the making the links, making the, seeing the patterns mm. between all of these different things. And once you do that, you will understand, okay, this is why perhaps I've been showing up in my love life in this way. Yeah. And when you have that awareness, that's when you can start to show up differently. You know how you, oh, because you went on to like the thing of like, what were you trying to win? Is that step two yeah. or is that still step one? That, that in, in my work, it's all step one, really. It's, okay. it's understanding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could okay. call it that step two. Don't, don't worry about <laughs> step that. Step 1.5. Yeah. Yeah. So, 1. Um, 1. yeah. 
One of the things that I have found really helpful in this as well, because like a lot of my patterns came from my dad and, you know, obviously the work is never good, never done. As as you said, like I just did a breathwork session the other day and this really huge, um, really huge breakthrough uh, that I had and this memory of being like 11 years old and just this thing happening and I won't go into it now, but it helped me heal so much um, with my dad and uh, mm-hmm. in my relationship, it's just been like this huge weight that's lifted. Um, maybe I'll talk about it another time, but what I'm, what I'm saying by that is like, you just keep peeling back the layers over, you're never done with this. Right. Yeah. So one of the things that's really helped me in that seeing what I was trying to win that, on that note, um, and realizing like, and almost like you've got to forgive your parent for not being able to love you in the way that you wanted that love. Because if you're constantly trying to reenact and recreate this parent child dynamic in your relationship, you're just going to keep going around in circles until until you realize and forgive your dad or your mom for being the flawed human that they were and not being able to show up for you a hundred percent in that time. Mm. That for me has been game, like completely world changing because we expect our parents to be these perfect examples of love and when they don't meet every single need of ours we then project that onto our partners so for me like having that realization of like my dad was doing the best that he could he had his own flaws and so did my mum. you know it wasn't perfect these are the things that they were going through they didn't have the tools and really like forgiving him for that and not now holding Rick to those exact same standards. Yes, that is. In fact, that is one of the steps, my love. Like, oh, I'm sorry, I yeah. skipped ahead. No, 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 no. You're, but you're completely right. And uh, like, that has been the biggest thing. What's interesting is I, like, I really believed I'd forgiven my parents so, like, long before I even started doing this work. But what's interesting is the way that I was living my life, I hadn't. Like I hadn't let it go, but I was putting all of that anger towards myself and I didn't realize it was all unconscious, but I hadn't truly forgiven them because I, you like, how can you truly forgive and truly let go until you're aware of what the fuck is going on in the first place? And that's why step one is such a meaty motherfucking step. <laughs> like, there's so much to it. And, and you know what? I, I really believe, and I, I always have to say this is like it, cause I think obviously my parents' story is such a significant part of mine. Um, I never want it to come across that I'm like, you know, the, the, the joke about therapy that it's like, it's all the parents' fault. Um, but listen, the pe- look, let's be honest, parents have a huge influence over it. But the minute, again, I want to stress, when you become an adult, it ain't their problem anymore. Whatever they've done, it's up to you how you choose to deal with it. And the fact is, I don't think, like even, you, you know, you, me and you, Mel, we've done so much work on ourselves. Guaranteed, if, when, whatever, we become mothers, we're going to fuck up. Like they, it might not mm. be so massive, but who can say, like, I think until you have had a child, how can you possibly know? Like, and, and, and yeah. I've got clients who had idyllic family life and there's still going to be stuff there because we're human. Oh, like, totally. You know? Babe, like, I remember when I first started doing this work, I was like, I had a, I had a fucking great childhood. I don't know what you're talking about. There wasn't anything like my dad loved me so much. My mum loved me so much. And like you can still think that your parents were like these perfect, amazing parents, but like there will still be stuff to look at, you know, yeah. stuff around, you know, what your identity was um, as a kid growing up, stuff around like, you know, just memories that you have, like, you know, like you said, there's there's really, I really think this is part of the human experience is to to recognize these, these you know, blocks that are, you know, stopping us from having the life that we want, unlearning them, so that we can remember the truth. And I think if we didn't have these imprints, these, you know, traumas, whether it's trauma with a small T or trauma with a big T, if we didn't have them, it's almost like there's no challenge to overcome in life to help us become more of our authentic self. You know, we've got to dig through that in order to live the lives that we really want to. I think it's just absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. So if you are like going through your life and you're like, I don't have any work to do. I had a perfect childhood you're like you you're cheating yourself out of a out of a life that you could have you could have the most amazing soulmate relationship but if you're not willing to look at your own stuff you're cheating yourself out of that yeah and you just live life in like 3d and there's more d's to be lived like there's there's so much more than what we see 
And I really, I feel like 2020 has definitely been the year for us to, to really see that that is true. Um, do you want to just be sort of satisfied and tick the boxes? Or do you want to live a life that is like really fucking juicy and challenging and hard at times, but exciting and inspiring and all of the stuff? Because that is what your opportunity is. We get to do this thing once, as far as we know, in the form that we are in. And like, you know, I can't even remember who said the unexamined life is is not worth living. Someone very important. Um, I can't remember <laughs> who wrote that, but you know, great quote. That. And it's true. It's like, you know, I just feel for people like I get why, because I do, I, I understand. I look at some people and I'm like, you, like you are just, you're not interested in going any deeper. And I do understand it because the reality is, and anyone watching this will probably know, waking up is really fucking painful. And a lot of people in 2020 are waking up and whatever that's been, if like, you know, my, my gateway in was through my relationships because they were such a fucking mess. I mean, I mean, there was so much other stuff to heal, but that was my portal in. That was my biggest transformation. Um, you know, for some people it's gonna, it's gonna have taken a pandemic. Some people it, like pandemic won't have even done it. And I'm just like, you know, what will it <laughs> that is so true. Like what <laughs> will it literally? Do you need a sword <laughs> pan? What will it take minute? for you to what wake up? Some people, you know what it makes me think of though? It's that Yogi Bhajan quote. And he said, one third of the world will wake up, one third will die, and one third will go mad. I get shivers whenever I say that because like, oh my, my God, God, we're seeing that now, aren't we? We're really seeing that now. And yes, so you we are. Think, but you know what? It's hard anyway. Like whatever way you choose, it's hard anyway. Wouldn't you want to choose the way that at least there's some good shit <laughs> on the other side of it? Because you know what? And I know that you get this. The better it gets, the better it gets. Like I, mm-hmm. like every single year of my life, even though it is not without its challenges, certainly this year, our wedding got, you know, like in the grand scheme of things, our wedding being canceled, like feel, you know, is fine. Um, but, it, you know, it, it was hard. I've had a lot of other stuff, you know, over the years that was super hard. But Every single year, when I look back overall at the year, I'm like, it it, it was better. Mm. Yeah. Because the more you do the work, the better it gets. Exactly. The more you invest in yourself, the more you do the work, your life just keeps getting better every single year because you have the tools to work on any block that comes up. Exactly. Let's get through, let's get through these steps, babe. I want to hear the rest in- of these steps. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So the so we're looking, we've done the big motherfucker step one. The next step is all about connecting. Um, and that is, you know, whatever that means to you. For me, I, you know, I come from 12-step philosophy. I went to I go to Al Anon, which is friends and family is for addicts and alcoholics. That was my sort of yeah, I I'd done church and stuff when I was younger, but this 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 way that um spirituality was presented to me was and it's the, it's how we speak about it in the inner fix was the most effective for me and the most beautiful and profound because it is it's all about a god of your understanding you don't even have to use the word god higher power they talk a lot about higher power another way to say that is you know connection with source connection with the universe with the the energy of love connection with your your higher self it doesn't really matter what the word is this is um believing that that you know believing in love really Um, and falling like learning to really connect into that energy and connecting into trust and and part of this step is also getting clear on like you know what what do I value what what are my core values in life like don't even worry about a relationship yet let's start with what do I value in life this is so useful like for me freedom and when I base every single uh, decision in my life it's like how free do I feel do I expand or contract when I think of that thing I've based my entire career around it acting I did not feel free at all it turns out I did when I was like the few times I'd be on stage but the rest of it just didn't work whereas my my uh, you know my my career now it's it's much better suited to me it's not without it's it's um pitfalls of course but but for a relationship like if you value freedom and you get with like I've got this whole thing about farmer and sailor we talk about the effects so uh, this is so useful like a sailor character type they're adventurers they're risk takers they like the open water they're impulsive negative things might be you know maybe a bit too risky maybe not that loyal maybe not that trustworthy a bit of a commitment phobe then you've got the farmer character type and a farmer the good parts like loyal loves routine like steadfast like shows up like 
um, reliable, all these things. But the negative, the shadow side might be like not great at taking risks, might be a bit controlling, you know. So it really to yeah. be really, really embodied, it's like it's 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 we want to get rid of, uh, well, not get rid of totally, but, you know, uh, like shed the the negative the shadow parts of both and and also embody both of you know I've become so much more of a farmer um and Joe I met Joe and Joe is like totally in the middle and uh, you know total sailor in ways total farmer in other ways which is just exactly what I want and what I need and so understanding like what do I value and what are non-negotiable like for like if you for example if you want to live like like you and Rick are a great example of this like you both travel you both like that you were not going to be happy either if you just like being stuck in one place for the rest of your life like you you want to be able to yeah. to have adventures like we're both similar like that if you're with someone who that they that is like their idea of hell it's probably not going to work not so it's, it's work. about compatibility yeah. but you can't be compatible with someone else until you which quite frankly until you're compatible with yourself until you understand what makes mm -hmm. you tick and you know if you ask me all these questions it, I didn't know them for a long time so that's that's what that step is all about um and yeah that farmer sailor thing can I just yeah. interrupt with the farmer sailor thing because yeah. the farmer sailor thing also feels a bit like what we spoke about earlier with the good good guy bad guy thing because yeah. it feels like people swing yes. between being with a farmer and then being with a sailor um yes. which is yes, totally yes. what I experienced and um like really loyal farmers and then really wild sailors and mm. yeah I felt when I met Rick I was like you are great I didn't like consciously think this but he is a really good in the middle um yeah. and I don't know where I would sit right now I feel like I'm probably yeah I feel like I'm in the middle as well actually mm. but I really love that way of thinking about things and yeah anyway mm. continue no, that was I just, just love, a little tidbit I just, like, put me in a box I'm like oh God. it's just it's just too, oh no I like um, it to understand yeah and um you know, there's all sorts of different farmers and different sailors. It's just to understand yeah. yourself. And I find that super, super helpful. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that connection, that spiritual connection, which helps you understand yourself. It helps you to trust. Like surrender is a huge, this is where all the surrender stuff is in, in my program, in this particular module. I call it <clears throat> surrender to the festival because when I met Joe, it was obviously at a festival and we met. And then he texts me the next day to meet up, but he didn't reply to my text. Like, you know, all of this stuff, like, and I just had to like, let it go. Stop trying to look for him at this festival in the same way. Stop trying to look for your soulmate on a bloody app or like, it's not say apps are bad, but if you're like in that energy of obsession, you've got to find it. Your job is not yeah. to find your soulmate. I'm going to say that again. Your job is not to find your soulmate. Your job is to connect to your own soul. That is it. And to show up in as healthy um, and as authentic ways in not just your romantic dynamics, in every dynamic, practice it with your friends. Because I guarantee, like I saw it, I was like, God, I'm even worse. I can be even worse in friendships with showing up as my authentic self than I can in rom romance mm -hmm. because my that friend expects me to show up like this. So that's what I do. And and also boundaries, like all of that stuff. Your job's to show up as, as healthy ways as you can. It's not to find that person. If you try and find the person, yeah. you will fuck it up. Trust me. I wrote the book on that, literally. So then we move on to the next step, which is you've already touched on, which is about forgiveness. It's about letting go. You can't do that. Like really, I, I wouldn't know how to do that if I didn't have that spiritual connection because where am I letting it go? Where am I letting go of this pain and this hurt and this disappointment and this resentment? It's trust. It's kind of going like, I don't want to carry that anymore. So I'm going to release it. And when it comes to, you know, part of my work, I get get clients to write, you know, letters to exes. And also what always comes up is letters to parents or letters to, you know, a friend that really broke their heart or letters to their bullies because they don't realize that they're carrying all that shit from their bullying into their romantic dynamics. Like it, all of it, we carry all of it. And so you kind of want to, you know, you want to, 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 they, as they say, I think, um, in Buddhism, it's like, you want to have your, an empty bowl, you know? Um, mm. and so it's being open. That's really what that is about clearing space and being open. The next step is, or this, this is where it's like, I almost feel like the, the first steps are about like looking back and clearing all that and, and then getting you present and with a clean slate. And then the next step is about, okay, so where do we rebuild you now? Like, what do we do with that? And it's about self-worth. 
self-respect, like really loving and owning who you are, getting to know who you are and, and being unapologetic for that. And at the same time, and that's, it's about, you know, having boundaries to honor, you know, boundaries that honor who that person is. So, you know, like for me, if I, at first I didn't know who the hell I was. So how could I possibly have boundaries? Like what my boundaries might be, might be completely different to what your boundaries are. Like everyone's entitled to have what works for them and what's important to them. And then it's up to the other person to go, that's going to work for me or not. But, you know, otherwise we just go through our life, like just being either trampled on or trampling on other people, usually a combination of them both. So that's what that step's about. The next step's my, like, well, the next step's the funnest step. I think there's actually six. Well, like in my program, there's seven. (laughs) I don't know. I've got all jumbled up today because I I read something before this that was like, oh, five. And I've just written things in slightly different order, but I'm putting that, this, this bugger off. (laughs) She can post it. I can't even read the writing off anyway. Um, The next step is all about getting super clear on like, what do you want? Like, what is your dream partnership? Like, and what I get them to do, get clients to do is like picture like your ideal lifestyle and also, you know, your ideal day. Like, how does it feel? Don't worry about what the person looks like, but like, how do you spend your time? And it's so interesting because I take them through a really guided meditation with this. And so often they're like, oh, it was actually quite unexpected. Like what I thought I would want to do, or I should do, that's usually a big thing, is not actually Mm -hmm. what my soul wanted at all. And so you yes. get so clear, like, what are those qualities that I are like non-negotiable for me in another person? And, you know, uh, the, the, the fundamental tenant of my work is we need to stop looking outside of ourselves for the partner we want to get. We need to start looking inside of ourselves for the partner we want to be. So once you've written that list of like, oh, I want him to be like this, 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 and this. And then you look at that list, you go, <laughs> star the non-negotiables, forget about finding a guy like that and become those things yourself. And trust me, you'll have your work bloody cut yeah. out for you. And then I get them to yeah. also, yeah, how do you want your relationship to feel? Write all that down, do all the exercises around that. Go and make your life feel like that. And then what you've done mm. is you've become an energetic match for both that person and that relationship. And it's fun. And there's no looking. It, that is, it's genius. And then it's like, how can you not meet the one? Because you are an energetic magnet then. Um, but yeah, like this is the real work, you know, this is, this is going to get you what you want and make it last rather than just going round and round in circles, um, wondering what the hell is wrong, wondering Mm -hmm. why you can't get the right guy, keep the right guy, meet someone that wants to commit to you. You know, this is the real, these are the real tools. Like, I hope you guys Mm -hmm. have been taking notes because this has been amazing. Thank you so much, Persia, for all of your wisdom. <laughs> oh my god, what? No, don't worry. Babe, I thought that was the last step. No, All right, no, go on. Give me the last like, step. Five steps, seven steps. How many steps? <laughs> Make That's this right. We're not done. We're not done. No, We're not done. Go on. What's the next wanted, step? The reason I wanted to say this last step is because interestingly, this is the step that everyone's obsessed with. Like everyone wants to know how to do this because the last step is like, okay, so having done all those other all that work then how do you actually show up in your love life so what are your boundaries in your love life what are you know what are your red flags because again yours might be different to mine depending on your own experience um what uh like communication um like how do you actually put those boundaries down and also right. like how do you know if this person is the one all of those things like how do you know what are the what are the ways to know and and everyone wants to know this because no one wants to do the hard work and this is what you said earlier about like everyone just want to know the quick fix so they come to me and they go oh can you just tell me what text to write to him i'm like no because you mm. are not yet you are not yet the person who knows what to write like that's your work. You need to become the person who knows what to write in that moment. And I've had clients yeah. like show up and be like, oh, Persh, can you tell me what to say to him? And I'm just like, no, because like, you're not understanding it then. I can't like, that's that's the equivalent for me just like, oh God, I sound like such a boring geography teacher here, but like, that's like the equivalent to me just doing your homework for you. And then you come to sit the exam and you haven't got a fucking clue. Like it's all bullshit. Yeah. You need to become that person. So yeah, the world wants to know the quick, fast, deep way but as you the quick fast way not the deep way the shallow way and as you quite rightly pointed out Mel it there is not a shortcut like you no the the biggest shortcut you can do is to is to do this work because otherwise you're gonna have a midlife crisis I'm just gonna put it bluntly like like I want people to do this work before they get married it's never too late listen whenever you're watching this Mm. it's never too late but 
that there is, do you know when the best time to start this was? Yesterday. The second best time is like right now. <laughs> like it's not Amen. Amen. I mean, I found myself doing this work, you know, a year after getting divorced when I was 25. You know, not everyone listening to this podcast will know that, but I got engaged when I was 20 to a man that I thought was my perfect match, thought we were going to stay together forever. He was perfect. He was, um, when I met him, I thought he was a sailor, but then he turned out to be a farmer. And anyway, that's not important. What's important was we just weren't a, weren't a right match because I didn't know who I was, hadn't done any of this work, didn't have a clue who I was, didn't know what I wanted in my life. Mm-hmm. And I found myself, you know, having a quarter life crisis at 23 going, what the hell am I doing? This is not my life. And then at 25, mm-hmm. getting, getting a divorce and then having to do this work, you know, after having turned my life upside down. So yeah, like I think, you know, obviously before I was like, oh, and that's all the steps. But I think, you know, the first four steps are the really, really important one. The last one is like the, the icing on the cake. That's really. exactly it. That's exactly it. It's the icing on the cake, but don't even bother don't even waste my time coming to me and asking me how to fucking write a text to this twat that you're dating. Like, it's just, <laughs> you, you, you're you just, it won't serve you. It just won't serve yeah. you. It really won't. Right. No one wants to eat a cake that's just icing and no cake. You know, you want the real cake. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I actually it was like that. I fucking love icing, but I'd probably be really, like, we'd be really sick from it. <laughs> and that's the point. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, like, a whole load of icing you'd probably feel really sick and that's exactly how you feel when you're in like a toxic bullshit dynamic with someone and you know what it's not their fault because you're choosing to be there and that was one of the hardest lessons I ever learned it's like stop blaming him for ghosting you and start asking yourself why do you keep going back when he turns up like months later because you don't love yourself and you certainly don't respect yourself and that's where the deep deep work is yeah, a hundred percent. And one of the things that Rick and I, when when we always talk about relationships and patterns and things like this, we say like, you know, we're we're gonna if we like if you don't do the healing work yourself, you're just gonna meet other people that create that that show you the exact same patterns just with different faces. Yeah. So it's no use thinking, oh, this one's a dickhead, but I'm sure the next one will be great because if mm-hmm. there is something in you that is attracting these toxic patterns that it takes two people to create a toxic relationship, not just one guy, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of responsibility for you to take. And, you know, once you meet someone that you are willing to be healing partners for, I think it's really important that you, that, I mean, this, I feel like we need to do another podcast episode for this because there's a whole, another conversation that I'd love to have with you about like identifying who's a healthy mate and who's a toxic mm. who's not a healthy mate I feel like that's a whole mm. other thing that we could mm. dive into for another hour um mm. but then the work doesn't stop you know then you do the healing work together in relationship and help mm-hmm. each other grow and heal um in your partnership so you want yeah. someone that's not re-traumatizing but someone that is actually able to love you able to help you both of you heal together in this beautiful team teammate partnership. Um, 100%. And what yeah. I always say is, you know, we attract the people who offer us the maximum opportunity for growth and healing. And so that mm. looks different at different times. The re- so, so for example, if you're like, but I keep attracting ghosters. Okay, so you keep attracting people who are abandoning you. So the lesson right now, this is, don't even worry about this guy ever being your husband because he ain't gonna be, let's be honest. Your lesson here is <laughs> stop fucking abandoning yourself. Stop it. That's yeah. that's the lesson here. You're not ready to even get to, to, to meet that person yet where you could have a, a grown up relationship because you've that like all of this stuff, like there's a series, it you know, it's a process. And like even as you yeah. know, you've been on it and I w- will continue to, me and Joe, like five years, it's got it was it's super hard at the beginning in a lot of ways, got better and better, got easier. But we'll look, we've got different things coming up now, like you know like buying houses yeah. and all this, like not as, you know, like really exciting and really, you know, there's, there's all like for us, that's like really terrifying. I will like, you know, Joe will bungee jump. I'll, I will do all these crazy things, but it comes to something that actually for someone else is like the ticking of the box thing. And me and Joe are like, ah, commitment. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, no, no feeling. But we attract the person that, that, you know, offers the maximum opportunity for growth and healing, which means that the person that you, even the person you end up with, they will probably, like, not even they will probably, guaranteed, they will have enough of the thing that is a really painful thing for you, if that makes sense, and vice versa. Yeah. But 
it's not so much that it can't work. Does that make sense? It's mm. enough that you will have to heal that at a deeper level and you can mm. get over it if you're both willing to do it. But it's not so much that it's like, well, this is just the same old pattern again and again. And the difference is like, are they willing to show up? Are they willing to have like, don't worry about all the big words. Are they willing to have a conversation with you and go, listen, I know this is like when you're not in the activated space, but I know this is super hard. I know this is super challenging, but I love you. And I want, I want to, I want to work it out. Like, what do we need to do? That's yeah. the place. If, you, if you've got that, you're doing well. Amazing. Amen. Oh, Persia, I love you. I love all this so much. I feel like people are going to have absolutely loved this conversation. Um, okay, three questions that I always ask every guest on Love, Sex and Magic. What is one thing right now that you are loving? Oh, I am loving. Oh, my goodness. I am. Do you know what? I'm just going to say I'm loving the cockapoos. We're at Joe's family's place in Cornwall. <laughs> I'm, glad I'm, you, I'm glad you I'm finished that Cornwall. word, babe. <laughs> I genuinely thought you just said I am loving I'm just gonna say it I'm just loving the I'm cock right now <laughs> aren't loving we all maybe that's what you should call this episode loving the cock um probably get a few views that can do that um but no, I'm loving the cock of poos. I'm loving Cornwall all the trees um I'm loving I'm just loving being in nature like this has been um we spent lockdown at Joe's families in um Worcestershire and it was, and there's, they've got land and, you know, it's like, it's just, oh, it was just, I was like, this is what, this is where I want to be. I love London, but I want to be, I, I will love London more as a visitor, I think. So I'm loving mm. being with my man in nature. He's outside, like making a fire right now with the doggies and like roasting marshmallows. Aww. Like I'm in heaven. I, I can't, like, why would I ever want to go to a nightclub? Like, no, thank you. <laughs> the only problem I'll do is like that. festivals. Yeah, so that's mm. what I'm <laughs> so that, that was a very <laughs> no love that love that you found your own your own version of heaven love it and mm -hmm. um, something that turns you on oh it could be like a trait or a quality in someone or a smell or a taste oh uh, you know what do you know what, the the times where I mean smell yeah like smell absolutely but the the thing that came to my head first is like. I always have a, you know, like I call it fresh burst of love. I'm like, oh, I just had a burst of love. And I can have it with girls. I can have it with anyone. But like, I get it with Joe when we're in a group, often if we meet new people and I just watch him go and make effort with the person who's like shy or quiet. And uh, just like, just, I mean, he can just talk to anyone. He has no, like, it just doesn't filter like ranking or any of that shit. He's just like, so available to everyone and it's so beautiful and I just look over at him mm. and I'm so proud that 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 guy is with me and I'm with him like I just feel so and I just like oh my god you're so gorgeous as well I love it it's like when someone is completely present and not like you know not not aware of themselves in that moment does that make sense that's always so that's why like you know watching a musician or like a really good actor like I'm always drawn to someone who's completely abandoned to the moment whatever that might look like Mm, I love that and I, I also like really appreciate that about Joe he's totally like that just doesn't give a crap about I'll never forget the time we were in Bali at the the W hotel and we were having we were having like shisha or something and Joe just like in the W hotel just took all his clothes not completely naked but he's like I'm hot and he just, <laughs> he doesn't really like he doesn't really care he just is very sort of uh, quite trivial <laughs> every every time I've met Joe in a public setting whether we've been out at a restaurant or a bar or something or at a party he's always he just instantly puts you at ease you know mm. there's never any kind of awkwardness or like um you know airs and graces and oh we've got to behave mm. like this he's just fully himself in every setting which I love about mm. him too mm. and when was the last time this is the last question when was the last time you experienced magic Okay, I've got to tell you this, babe. I don't think I, I, oh no, I think I might have told you this, but okay, I'm get So just before I got on this call, so we basically were guided to, um, to, to buy a house in nature. It's been something on the cards, but it's, it's all happened like this. And it, and it's been, honestly, it's the same journey as I swear to God, trying to find your soulmate, trying to find your house, stop trying to find it and let it find you. And my dad, so I was like literally property pawning all over Zoopla and Right Move and like nothing, it just was like not really happening. 
Um, and I was trying to force it. Like, you, you know, that feeling when you're trying to date someone, you're just forcing the fart so much. Um, and then it becomes <laughs> it. Um, so then my dad, like, this, this is like a week ago, messages me and he's like, oh, this house. And it's in this place where, um, which I know, and it's not too far from my parents, but it's beautiful, it's in nature. And anyway, anyone who's watching this who knows me, and if you don't, like, just go on my website and you'll understand why. But like, we, me and Joe have got this huge thing about dinosaurs and Jurassic Park. It's like so many crazy synchronicities of how we met <laughs> linked to Jurassic Park. Like, unbelievable. I'm writing a book at the moment, and, like, I wrote them all down. I was like, this is, I mean, that that is some whack. Co- I, even the, like, biggest cynic c- couldn't believe these. Anyway. I was like, oh, is you know, how do I know if it's the right house? And I just Googled the place and I found out that this place, Cranley, it's called, in 2017, they found dinosaur bones there. They found quite a lot of dinosaur bones there. I didn't even know dinosaur bones were found in this country. Um, Jurassic World filmed there recently, which Joe's little brother is on. And also, um, my sir, and there's a really famous uh, artist who used to live there called Lawson Wood. That was their surname. My surname's Lawson and Joe's mum's maiden name is Wood. So today it's like realizing that I've got these three pieces of like magical synchronicity, which are carried on from me and Joe, um, you know, meeting. And it's like, God, it, it really is possible. Like all of that magic, if you choose to believe it, I swear that's like a line from Peter Pan <laughs> or Hook or something like that. But I just, I really do believe that the, the universe, higher power, whatever you want to call it, it will give you what you expect. And, mm. and what I expect is a lot of dinosaurs and a lot of like crazy fun synchronicities and magic because that just makes me smile. Yeah. And I get so much of it. And that's the place that I want to live my life from because it's so much more fucking fun. Oh, I love that so much. I completely agree. I feel the exact same, just with a different, different, different vision, different set of synchronicities, but I completely mm. am on that page. Babe, this has just been amazing. So good. Thank you so much for your time. Um, we're going to head over to the Goddess Collective soon because we've got some of the members in there that are asking for some more questions with you around boundaries, setting boundaries in relationships, stalking dates or exes on Instagram, uh, getting attached to people. Uh, you know, We're going to dive in a little deeper with our members in there. But for now, where can everyone come and find you, hang out with you, work with you? Where can they come and chat and get some more Persia style love? So PajLawson.com is my website with all the info. Um, I'm very active on Instagram, which is just at PajLawson. Um, and I've got a great free, free Facebook group called uh, Persia's Love Hub. So, um, and I do, you know, free trainings and all sorts of stuff in there. And we've got some really exciting stuff coming up. So, you know, come come and connect with me on Instagram and just say hi, because I'd love to get to know you. Um, that's almost, I'd say, probably the best place. Love that. Well, thank you so much, Angel. Can't wait for everyone to listen to this episode. Me neither. Hope you loved this episode, guys. It was brought to you by Yoni Pleasure Palace, the place to go to for all of your sensual and self-pleasure needs. So if you want to add a touch more luxury and divine feminine essence to your self-pleasure practice, I highly recommend you head over to yonipleasurepalace.com. Use my name, Melissa, for your discount of 25% off your entire order. Today I want to show you this cervix serpent, which is extremely powerful for cervical de-armoring and healing inside of your cervix. So extremely powerful toys you can get for yourself at yonipleasurepalace.com. Enjoy, let me know what you think, and I'll see you in the next episode.